Good late afternoon, early evening to everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today uh, to celebrate California's majestic trees. I am Shannon Miller, the Dean of the College of Humanities and Arts here at San Jose State, and I want to welcome all of you, including our many sponsors and supporters of the, this event, all of whom are committed to sustainability, ecology, and the really important questions of what we can do to support our amazing California trees and the stunning, beautiful state that has faced so many challenges as a result of climate change. The vision of this amazing slate of presenters began with us thinking about a pre-show for Triology, which is a musical event that will be happening here at the Hammer Sunday night. Um, it will be premiering as it has across four different CSUs in the system. But as our planning progressed, it became clear that the richness of the work of professors Robin Lasser, Christopher Luna Mega, and Amanda Stysewicz, as well as allowing us to get to know more about the work of the Wildfire Interdisciplinary Research Center, led by Craig Clements, was worthy of a program all of its own. And then with my partner in crime, Kathy Harris, who directs our public programming initiative within the college, we drew in other partners who have provided us with raffle items, informational material, and other contributions to further extend the reach of tonight. I want to thank those willing to partner with the College of H&A, including Sports Basement, and uh, those who you can see along the side here who are tabling for us today, the AS Campus Community Garden, our own sustainability office here at SJSU Green Campus, the Guadalupe River Conservancy, and our city forest. I look forward to our activities following our three faculty presenters, including raffles and um, other conversations that will happen right here in Hammer 4. Little did we know that today would have a theme of fire and ice connecting our current meteorological conditions and the work of our faculty. But I'm fascinated to see the many connections between the work of these four faculty, as well as across the arts, social sciences, and the sciences. So let me fir first introduce the faculty, and then we'll jump in. I will be presenting a film by Robin Lasser, professor of art here at San Jose State University. Then assistant professor Christopher Lunamega will present music that was produced with fire data. Then we will hear via video, as I mentioned, from Amanda Stastowicz, professor of environmental studies, um, who is, as I said, stuck on the other side of 17. And finally, I'm sure we will be folding in Craig Clements of the Department of Meteorology during the question and answer period. He is the director of the Wildlife Interdisciplinary Research Center and the Fire Weather Research Laboratory, and he is the person we have to thank for his fabulous trucks that are outside the theater that I hope all of you got to see. With that, I'm gonna kick this off by reading some comments from Robin Lasser before showing her film. Um, she may be live streaming, and if she is, we might be able to get some short answers from her to questions that people might have. So here are her comments, and you'll understand why she's not here with us today in person. I am here today with you in spirit. Now, as you listen, I sit with my 100-year-old father Together, we are experiencing my brother's eulogy. Over the years, as an artist, I have worked with fire as a metaphor for our time of mass extinction as the anth Anthropocene becomes the Pyrocene. The 10-minute film shared today is conceptualized and shot by myself, Robin Lasser. The imagery includes thermal photography traditionally utilized to map heat within a fire zone and digital video documentation of a prescribed fire taking place at Bloggett Forest Research Station, an experimental woods in the Sierra Nevada. The text is part science, part poetry, presented as postcard narratives. The sound is created in collaboration with the trees on site, utilizing sensors that capture the electric lights of the trees, breathing and drinking, translated into song by assigning the signals a tone, a key, an instrument. This film documents the science and art of a prescribed burn. Robin was joined by a team of scientists from UC Irvine, UC Riverside, and Berkeley. 
artists and scientists collaborating to better understand the process of using prescribed fire to shape and restore landscapes. So we will now take a look at her film. Personally, I recognize fire as a critical ecological process that maintained the functioning of the mixed conifer forest. And so, yeah, why, yeah, why not use fire? Like, that's, if that's the process that we're missing, let's reintroduce it. Let's reintroduce it at the same, uh, you know, kind of fire regime that it had before. Dearest smoke and mirrors, the burn boss is aware of the archaeology of longing, loss, and legacy. She imagines shaping the landscape with prescribed burns to lessen the intensity of the inevitable wildfires. She wonders if the black-lunged trees still standing sing survivor songs. Does the risque mother tree survive best within an environment sculpted by mastication and controlled burns, preparing her to outwit her hungry wildfires? Does cooking the planet make us a geologic force? You are a volcano lover. Robin. Overall, the project is called SPARKS, which stands for Smart Practices and Architecture for Prescribed Fire. In California, it's Sparks Cal. So this is a UC, multi-UC campus research project. Tirtha Banerjee is the lead on it, uh, and I'm a, um, um, a co-PI with, with Tirtha. Like it's everyone's responsibility to, to keep their head on a swivel, as you say, uh, and look out for hazards. And then if you see one, you want to communicate. So we have in FIRE, we have this acronym, or this initialism, I should say, L-C-E-S. It's look out, communicate, escape route and safety zones. I'm Audrey O'Dwar and I'm a PhD candidate at University of California, Irvine in the Department of Earth System Science. And what are you doing here today? What brought you to the prescribed burn at Logic? We're here measuring PM 2.5, which is the fine particulate matter from smoke that we get in the atmosphere during fires. Ideally, in our prescribed burning, we're getting back to um, kind of the practices during indigenous land management where they were able to manage these fuels that lead to bigger, more destructive wildfires like we're seeing today. Um, these older fuels burning in the prescribed fires, um, that's what they're aiming to target so that during the natural fires, they don't lead to these um, large destructive ones. So in the future of wildfires, we should be seeing younger fuels in those emissions because ideally we've targeted those older fuels in our prescribed burning practices. Dearest Flame, we have made history together. Fuel, oxygen, heat, that is our love triangle. You are unique to the earth and shaping your presence is unique to our humanity. We are your keystone species. Somewhere between the last Australopithecine and Homo erectus, hominins gain capacity to control fire and sculpt the landscape. You track our ecological agency. Touched by fire, Robin. So the thermal sensor is gonna look at um, the different ranges of temperature of the ground that kind of be the fire. Um, the LiDAR sensor is going to help us map the vegetation and so it's going to help us construct this 3D um, image of the, the canopy, the trees to kind of classify vegetation and these collections are done pre-fire. Um, the thermal sensor is used during the fire and post-fire we also collect um, LiDAR data and thermal data to, to kind of be able to quantify the difference in the severity of the burn. Hello, charcoal. Rumor has it your presence left in soils and lake beds coincide with human contact and the disappearance of many 
megafaunas. Human spark fire surpassing lightning for ignition control. Illuminating, warming, threatening. This game changer begs an ethic to reconcile power with responsibility. When left underground, you are a perfect archive of human activity. When dredged up and burned, you become something else, a little less lovable. Um, my name is uh, Jim Randerson, and I'm from the Department of Earth System Science at UC Irvine. And I'm here with um, Audrey today to study the smoke composition. And we're hoping to learn from the smoke um, what the chemical and the isotopic composition of the smoke is so that we can learn more about uh, the types of fuels that are being uh, combusted by the fire. Different uh, types of debris on this forest floor have different ages and depending on the time that they grew, the needles grew or the logs grew, they picked up a different uh, chemical composition from the atmosphere, a radiocarbon signature, a radiocarbon signature and that uh, is what um, what we're measuring today. And so from the weapons testing that was done in the 1950s and 60s by the Americans and the Russians, uh, there's a big spike of radiocarbon in the air and it labeled all of the trees and all of the vegetation that grew during that time. And so we're able to use that, that spike to help us then figure out if the material that's burning that was uh, growing in the 50s and 60s, if, um, if that stuff is now combusting, We've, we've got a ways to go to be burning at the scale that's going to be meaningful to help prevent these uncharacteristic fire events that we've been living through. Dear prescribed fire, wildfire, and cultural fire, yesterday, a collection of crows crying and cracking and swooping out of nowhere crossed overhead. In the experimental woods and the prescribed fires, are we shaping the space for restoration and renewal, or are we creating smoke screens, as some ecologists suggest? Or perhaps something more fluid, fire by fire in context? Which narrative to choose? Fire as expression of pure power? Reducing the fire's informing role to flame and fuel, heat and light. Consuming like a hungry ghost, never sated. Leaving behind only ashes. Or the primeval narrative where fire is a companion on our journey, where fire derives power by the character of its interaction with the natural world. Between these narratives, we have a tangled narrative full of paradoxes regarding which fires are good and which are bad as the Anthropocene transforms into a Pyrocene.
And I'm already seeing so many points of connection um, between the work that Robin is doing in this film and what Christopher's going to present, and then what I think Amanda's work will show us, that I think it makes sense for us to move on to Christopher and then plan to come back for questions that can integrate all three of these great presentations. Hi, good evening. Uh, thanks for being here. I'm very happy with the turnout. Uh, I thought it was going to be like three people. Um, so as Dean Shannon Miller said, I'm an assistant professor at the School of Music and Dance. I teach composition and electronic music. I'm also the coordinator of music technology in the School of Music. So today, um, I'm going to be talking about a project that is somewhat related to the previous uh, topic. Um, in this case, it's also dealing with data from the world and translating, in, tr translating it into music. Um, the very important aspect that I was really wanting to try to do here was to use that data as a foundation for music to be performed by human performers. So how does that embodiment of data um, translates, translate into music, and what are the effects of that? So this was a collaboration with um, Stephanie Rowe, who is a, who is a, um, she works for global, she's a global climate and energy lead scientist at World Wildlife Fund, and she's also a lead author of the International Panel for Climate Change uh, for the sixth assessment report. So her studies mainly are around the topic that you're seeing there, which is investigating the effects of increasing forest cover on climate, on climate, and then how does that translate into music? So the foundation of the project is that through Earth system modeling, Stephanie Rowe tested how expanding forest cover based on biophysical and sociopolitical realities will impact climate. Um, of course, the whole pitch here is to push heavily for reforestation and afforestation. Uh, quick note, afforestation is planting trees where there were not trees, basically. And reforestation is making forests return to where they're used to be. And so this is one of the many uh, climate change mitigation strategies that are around. And her field of exper expertise is forests. So her study is around this. And so her research ended in two different climate scenarios. So one of them is a very, um, let's say, uh, bold a climate scenario in which it's the greener world, as she calls it. It's a two degrees Celsius increase by 2100, from now till 2100. The other one, which she calls business as usual, is a more realistic scenario in which there's no action taken um, in reforestation and afforestation, and so there we have a four degrees Celsius increase. So after talking a lot with her about um, what paths we could take. She would just bring me Excel spreadsheets and data sets just with thousands of, of numbers and like a lot of different variables. And we were like, well, how are we going to make this happen? I mean, how are we going to make a piece that is not like extremely chaotic out of this? Like we, we need to kind of reduce the, the parameters that we are dealing with. And so we decided on these that you see in the bottom of the screen, which are uh, forest cover um, measured in millions of square kilometers, evapotranspiration measured in watts per square meter, uh, mean surface temperature in degrees Celsius, and finally albedo, which is the percentage of reflectance of the sun's energy back out of the earth. And so 
mainly uh, the idea is looking at these different um, variables being projected into the future over 100 years um, using this very sophisticated uh, Earth system modeling uh, device in Colorado. It's called NCAR. I'm not going to go too much into that, but uh, mainly through this search system modeling, we can predict all of the measurements of forest cover, evapotranspiration, mean surface temperature, and albedo for the next 100 years, taking into account social political realities, as I said, and, uh, and other natural realities as well. So just so that you can see a little bit how, I mean, this is pretty much the, the mother document that uh, Steph, Stephanie Rowe gave to me. Um, it contains the different variables there. Uh, you can see the green column, that's the forest cover. Uh, then we see the mean surface temperature. We also see evapotranspiration. We see albedo in yellow. And we see the comparisons back to back of the BAU business as usual and greener world. So you don't have to look very detailed at the numbers, but you can see the graphs on the right side of the screen. And, uh, and so the graph, um, the blue uh, lines are the business as usual predictions, and the orange lines are the greener world um, predictions. So you can see, for instance, in the forest cover one, in the greener world, I mean, it's pretty obvious. It's just like an ascending line. If everything happens very optimistically, this is where we'll, we'll be in terms of, of millions of hectares of forest cover versus if we continue the business as usual, and so forth. So once we had those, um, the question was, well, how are we going to make music with that? So I'm going to talk about that right after we look at this piece, uh, the, this, which is the opening movement. So it's two movements that we ended up doing. And this is going to be, this is not yet released. This will be released in an album. It's going to be premiered uh, sometime in the next year. So. Um, this piece is for piano, uh, myself playing it, and uh, electronics, mainly synthesizer and field recordings uh, recorded by myself. I'm, I'm very uh, interested in that field of sound as well. And so this video, what I'm going to play, you're going to see how these graphs are in time. They're evolving as you're hearing the music and you can see the year number on that left side of the screen and then the four variables um, that I discussed. So what I suggested you try to do as we're listening to the music is to try to listen for the translation of the data as, as, you're, as, as we're listening to the music. So for instance, uh, forest cover, uh, you can see there underneath the title what is being mapped from the data to the sound is number one, forest sounds. So as the, as the forest cover gets reduced over the years, forest sounds, you're gonna hear less of them. All of this was very carefully mapped with electronics. Um, then you're also gonna hear a pitch, a very, it's one of the most obvious ways to sonify data, which is just through pitch. Uh, so you're gonna hear that pitch descending and then finally, a very interesting aspect that I thought about th for this piece was tempo. So the, how fast or slow um, the unit of time is going to be moving. So just as an idea of how, you know, how, th how much thought can go to sonifying, um, you have two options here. Like, OK, if we have a very low amount of, of forest cover. Would that be a high tempo or a fast or, or a slow tempo? Would it be very fast or very low? So I thought about the heart beating, like as if the world was a, an organism. I mean, it is. And, uh, and the, the heart, uh, when we're under a lot of stress, it's very increased in its tempo, right? So when is it the most stressed? It is when the least amount of trees we have, according to this study. I mean, and I mean, I would totally agree with that. Um, when is it the least stress when most trees we have? So it starts in 2000. We're, I'm going to play a snippet from the beautiful 2020, right? Like beautiful 2020. Uh, <laughs> pandemic uh, starts, right? So uh, we're going to hear from 2020 to 2050, or approximately. And uh, so you're going to hear a tempo that is gradually increasing in, 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 
act in pace because in this business as usual scenario, we have a projected depletion of trees over the course of the century. So, so yeah, like the piano, for example, pitch as well. Um, the pitch is going to be changing according to the graph. So I'm going to play a little bit of this piece. Sorry, I just realized that I had not put it in here. I shouldn't let you. Okay, there So very briefly, I will just fast forward from 2045 till the end of the piece so that you can perceive the difference of the pitch ranges, the difference in tempo, like it's a completely different kind of ethos in the, in the piece. So, so that is, I, w I wanted to start by kind of the bummer, right? Like the, 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 the business as usual scenario and, uh, and then discuss a little bit of the mapping strategies that I used, like just kind of go into a more detail of what this entails, like going beyond the, just the kind of the, the usual way to sonify, which is going from data to electronics. Uh, but what happens when you have performers playing something that will likely be complex, like more complex. Um, 
we, I talked about a couple of things like moving tempo. Um, I mean, I know probably a lot of uh, people here are not that familiar with playing music with tempo, but if you are, just imagine, just imagine shifting from something like this fast to this fast, then a little bit faster, then a little bit slower, in very nuanced ways. It's almost impossible. So the only way to do that is by, um, is by having a click track. So my performers have a click track. I have a click track when I perform this piece. That means I have a headphone and I'm hearing the beat and I'm playing with the beat. It's kind of hard, but you kind of get used to it. And there's also a, what it's called a sound score. So a sound score, we are hearing the tone. You, you heard those synthesizers. So the performers are hearing something very similar on the headphone in order to be able to tune very specifically to that. Because otherwise, it's very difficult to tune because um, that just very briefly, I should say, there is a tuning system that we use like in the regular piano, white keys and black keys. But the, the, chro the chromatic field can expand so much. That's a, let's say it's a kind of reduced field of divisions of tone. So anyway, so all of these complexities went into the project. So in this case, the key for sonification um, is, for mapping, it is establishing the lowest and the highest values. So here we see uh, forest cover, well, the four variables that, that I'm talking about, how we have the data variables in green, low and high, so that's the lowest and highest value of the entire data set. And then we have musical parameters. We're mapping that into the lowest and the highest pitch in the musical parameters, or the lowest and the highest value of, like for example here, in temperature we have lowest value of minus 20 decibels, highest value of zero decibels. That's the maximum amount of volume that we can have. So that is done through a software called Max. MSP, at least I do it that way, and uh, it's very it's very smart. It, it allows you to create huge lists and map them and generate um, uh, sound from that. So I'm going to uh, show you. By the way, are we like on 10, 15 minutes right now? We should wrap up. Okay, so just going to quickly show you. Um, this, um, this, is, this is the patch. And like, for example, if you wanted to hear how that's forest cover, this is albedo. And we wanted to go to hear the whole 100 years in very short period of time. This is a 50th of a second. So, so this is where this is why I generated all of the contents for the piece. So, lastly, um, I want to show the um, the way that the performer um, responds to the material. So here, I'm going to play what the cellist for the brief fragment you're going to hear. Um, listen to while we were recording the piece. So that's what the cellist is hearing. And he's looking at this score as he's seeing the the the, chronom the metronome. So this is part of the considerations that go into into play when uh, when making a piece of music for performers. So uh, to end the presentation, I just want to show you 
a brief uh, a brief um, section of the bit the the greener world uh, section, which is with percussion, violin, and cello. So here, you're hearing the kind of convoluted state of where we're starting this piece. And then I'm just going to turn it all the way to where the, act the climate mitigation actions are picking up and kind of reducing the, the general Celsius increase. So more, more trees, uh, more, of course, more mapping of uh, recordings of nature, uh, a, a more consonant harmony, and so on. So yes, so many moving uh, <laughs> targets there in, uh, in the project. But yes, so that's uh, forest cover, business as usual, and greener world. Thank you very much. So thank you, Christopher. And so the last faculty member who will be presenting something um, is Professor Stansiewicz, uh, who will be coming in through video. And after that, we'll take some questions. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm so excited to be here today and be able to share with all of you a little bit about the kind of research I do. I believe by now you've already heard from Dr. Clements, who's our fearless director of the Wildfire Interest Today Research Center on campus. Um, I am a wildfire social scientist. I'm here to talk to you a little bit today about the research I do um, with the center um, for in the realm of, of wildfire. To get us started, what is wildfire social science? Um, wildfire social scientist goes out and studies um, kind of the psychology, sociology, it could be economics, it could be anthropology, dimensions of um, disasters, particularly I focus on wildfires. So I do a lot of work with communities and with agencies to kind of explore questions around wildfire adaptation, preparedness, evacuation, suppression, and recovery. Um, and I do this in a variety of ways. You can see here, we've got students with us work, um, in the Wildfire Interstate Research Center working on doing home evaluations for people, so home risk evaluations. And then we go back out later and we do things like interviews with those residents. We also run group meetings and focus group work, bringing together experts as well as community members to really think about how can we better serve communities. 
My research covers um, a broad part of the Western US. I focus on everything from fire adaptation and thinking about how we experiment with new or novel solutions to fire problems. Um, I explore a lot around conflict cohesion around fire. So how do communities and agencies come together to work together to deal with fire risk? And where, when those missions don't align, how do we deal with conflict in those spaces? How do we deal with stress? Another big area of focus for me is on technology. So how do we use AI? How do we use apps? How do we use predictive tools to better respond to fires, not just as agencies, but as communities or individuals as well? What am I supposed to do based on the information I have during a fire event, right? Um, and the last thing I focus on as well is gonna be the nexus of utilities and insurance and the constituents that they um, serve under heightened fire risk. But today, the majority of my research focuses on this thing called the WUI. Um, the WUI is a shorthand acronym for what's called the Wildland Urban Interface. Now, this area has a broad number of definitions based on who you talk to. Um, it's one of the largest growing areas for population in the US. Um, we have a lot of what's called infill going into these areas. So not just an expansion of people starting to live in more fire prone spaces, but the number of people living there are starting to increase. Um, when I use the term WUI in my research, it's a little bit more, I don't know, artsy maybe, it's a little bit more of a social construct rather than a, um, a something you could measure. So it's really getting at this idea of, for me, of where people are intermixed with or adjacent to wildland vegetation. And it really encompasses with how they connect with those landscapes. Because we know those place-based connections, that sense of place, that sense of this is why I love living here, is a huge motivator that's really hard to quantify for us when we're thinking about why don't all communities adapt the same way? Why would the same fire event drastically impact this other community over this one we see over here? And leading social science theory in wildfire has given us this rural to urban continuum or a spectrum of different types of communities that tend to occupy the WUI. Um, and the, this might range from on the very urban side, formalized suburban WUI communities are going to be things like gated communities. Um, you're out there for the privacy um, of, of living in this space. High many high resource communities are going to be like your ski towns or your national park gateway communities. There's amenities here. Everybody really cares about landscape management because of the access to those amenities and connection to landscapes in that way. In a rural lifestyle community, you might be out there just to get a back to the land feeling you love the wildlife. Um, these tend to be more rural, more remote communities than the others. And then the most rural and most remote tend to be our working landscape or resource dependent communities. Most commonly, these are going to be ranchers, farmers, um, and people in the timber industry. Now, when I look at these questions, I'm going to share a little bit with you now that you've got an idea of what does wildfire social science do, and at least my arena of it. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about a recent study I've been doing. So, so you may have heard of this. We have a great team at San Jose State who's been working quite extensively in the Santa Cruz Mountains um, around experiences with the CZU Lightning Complex from 2020. So I got um, the ability to kind of look at how different communities reacted to the 2020 fire siege, which is what we call the 2020 fire season overall, because we had so many fire events occurring. Um, a lot of us remember that summer and how the skies were orange. Um, it's the largest fire season in California's modern history with over 4 million acres burning, 10,000 structures lost, $12 billion in damages, a good chunk of that going towards suppression costs as well. Um, and this fire season really blew us out of the water um, because we broke records multiple times. So five of our new top 10 largest fires as of 2020, now I'm sorry, fires have entered this um, since then, but we had broken in five new fires from the summer 2020 had broken into our top six fires that were burning um, that year. Focusing on the CZU, which brings us into the Santa Cruz Mountains, bring us, brings us into the Redwood, uh, Coast Redwood systems that we are um, so focused on. Um, the CZU Lightning Complex, for those of us who have, don't have lived experience here, we don't have connection to this space necessarily, some stats for us. This fire was burning for 38 days. Um, different people were displaced for longer than that. Um, and some people did not leave. And we'll talk about, about all those different populations, those different impacts we might see. 
It burned over 86,000 acres, a pretty large fire, not the biggest one in the state. You see that these this number does not even break into our top 10 or top 20 largest fires um, in recorded history for California. But its impacts were disproportionate. And this is one of the reasons why utilizing terms like acres burn to, to convey fire impact is very misleading because you could have a 300,000 acre fire that doesn't that does a lot of good fire on a landscape versus a, a fire like this, which is much smaller, but actually has a higher societal impact. We had a lot of areas in this fire event that burned at high severity, which increases, it indicates a lot of tree mortality, a lot of um, impacts to the, the soils. Um, we also lost a lot of structures on this event, um, more so than even other fires that were bigger. So utilizing acres burned as a proxy for how bad a fire is, is it can be misleading. When I went into the CZU burn scar, um, I was looking for how different communities had experienced the same fire event. Um, any of us with uh, any experience with the Santa Cruz Mountains know that there, there are distinct communities that were um, affected by this fire. So one of those ways that we see um, kind of distinct fire experiences coming into play here, it's going to be in how people perceived of firefighting resources. Um, so a lot of people will say, you know, thank you. Thank you, first responders, including police and fire. Um, a lot of people are very grateful for the resources we did get on those fire events. Some participants had mixed feelings. Um, some felt that that you should be only thinking, saying thank you to some firefighters because different um, agencies that were responding had different approaches to dealing with the fire. Um, one of those approaches that was concerning folks was the narrative that was going around that um, one of the decisions being made was to let the fire burn or try to use the containment lines of Highway 9 and 17 as, as areas that we were going to definitely stop the fire at. Now, strategically, this makes sense. For um, a lot of fire suppression, we want to use established roadways as a fuel break. Um, but it made a lot of people feel like their homes were being given up on. Um, and because of this, it really changed the social landscape. So many people talked about how um, there had been previous small fires that had had good response in the last decade, both from the local fire departments and CAL FIRE. And that these entities not responding to the fire event in a more aggressive way um, created this feeling of a breach in social contract. So people were no longer um, relating to their fire service organizations in the same way they had before the fire, because they were saying that if I'm going to evacuate because you asked me to, that to me means that I'm saying, yes, I will evacuate so that you can save my home. Um, and people who did not see that happen we're feeling that, okay, next time that social contract has been broken, I can't trust you to come and save my home. So the next time this fire comes through, I'm actually planning to do something called staying and defending. I'm planning to stay behind until I feel like I need to evacuate. Now, this has a lot of ramifications um, under different conditions because our highest fatality group in any fire event that has had mass fatalities on it tends to be our people who evacuate late. So the safest group, route to go is to evacuate early, way in advance of a fire, even of a fire notification. And then people have the choice after that, if you don't evacuate early, to either evacuate late or to try to stay and defend or to shelter in place. And there's a lot of other options there for you, right? But one of the things we do want to make sure we're avoiding in, in fire is to avoid a, a late evacuation. In the Santa Cruz Mountains, people had place attachment, they had a lifestyle or, or microcultures within their communities of taking care of themselves, of being pretty resilient. And this kind of led to you know, kind of a mountain person feel. Um, and this led to the what I call the rise of the renegades. So there were a number of renegade brigades um, across rural populations actually decided to stay and defend during the fire. And this is something where it becomes interesting because as our fires grow larger um, and under those drought conditions and those conditions you're seeing that summer, this fire burned for a very long time. It burned for 38 days. So it's no longer a evacuate, you can come back in 48 hours. It's a evacuate and we'll tell you when you can come back and it might be weeks to months. Um, and so what we're seeing here is people who decided to stay and defend 
they actually were staying and defending for those weeks to months. They were behind fire lines. They had to figure out their own ways to get resources, including food and water. Um, access to electricity was not high during this time because those things get turned off during a fire event. Um, so this was an interesting development because there are calls across the nation to increase our local capacity to deal with fire events. Um, and often that's through the mechanisms of things like rural fire department participation. But we're also starting to see increased interest in a lot of, especially in mountain areas, of people being able to provide quick attack on fires um, within their own communities. So communities setting up, for example, their own hose lines um, or getting their own um, vehicles that they could take around to respond to fires. Now, where does this all go and why does this matter? And the last thing I wanna kind of tell you about is that the experiences we have with fire over time change how those communities are going to adapt. So I've been talking about fire adapted communities in my talk as a human community, but that term actually comes from fire ecologists talking about fire adapted e ecosystems and fire adapted, you know, trees um, and plants. And the idea here is almost one of biomimicry, is almost one of saying, if we are going to be humans living on a fire prone landscape, we need to also figure out how to live on that landscape. And that's going to look differently. There's no cookie cutter answer to that. So it's going to look differently in different places. So on this fire and the pre-fire context, when we're talking about adaptation. Um, we did not have at that point a lot of firewise organizations. We didn't not we had codes, but we did not enforce a lot of our codes. We had tenuous relationships with a lot of our fire service organizations. We also had this sense that redwoods don't burn because of the moisture level. Um, even though redwoods are a fire adapted plant species, um, they are very well adapted to fire and they have long outlived multiple fire events. Um, so there's an interesting situation there between people's ecological knowledge and their perceptions of their fire risk. When you go through the fire event, the fire event experiences, people either evacuated or they stay and defended mostly on this fire. And in a post-fire context, as our adaptation options have narrowed and we brought them back out now, we see the outcomes of this as we move into the next adaptation cycle. So our post-fire context is really, we can really rephrase that as a pre-fire context for the next fire event. And so our adaptation options in the post-fire event as we're moving into our next fire event preparation phase is the strengthening of the stay and defend mentality across the population. People are training each other, mostly to say that if we get stuck, how do we protect ourselves the best? We've seen an increase in joining things like firewise organizations or fire safe councils, um, rebuilds. We've had a lot of issues with rebuilds in the mountains um, post fire due to changing regulations and codes. We also see this grassroots um, effort and strengthening of suppression capacity. So. These are just some ways that you know, my research works in a lot of these spaces. Um, I wish I was there to take questions, but I just wanted to leave you with those thoughts of how, how we deal with um, our relationship to the places we live, especially when they're fire prone, is gonna be hugely important. Um, and in a lot of ways for people in the Santa Cruz mountains with coast redwood systems, a lot of that was this idea of Redwoods are our guardians or redwoods are adapted to burn. And we also now need to learn how to be adapted to fire um, just like them if we want to live here as long as they are. So thank you very much for your time. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to email me. So much um, and I want to thank all of our presenters uh, this has been really great really varied and I wanted to see uh, do people from the audience have some questions that they'd like to pose to any of the presenters and also to Craig Clements who is here um, who might be able to follow up on some of the specific things that Amanda for example was speaking about yes just one second Hi, um, this is for Christopher, it's a bit out there. Um, <laughs> but you're talking about um, experience, like enjoying being in the field and I'm really into trees. Um, and I read a lot about trees whispering and trees actually screaming, I've read, you know, like from drought and stuff. I just wonder, like you obviously 
it was the data was the data was what you interpreted to make the music. I just wondered if you ever considered like those sounds and how, what that actually might sound like trees whispering or screaming. I find that hard to think of. Thanks. Thank you for your question. Yeah, that's a, that's a great uh, question because there's actually um, existing recordings of of trees, you, I, I don't know if I would call it whispering or screaming, but there is a wonderful bioacoustician. So his life is going around the world um, recording soundscapes and, and preserving soundscapes. His name is Bernie Krauss. I strongly recommend you to check him out. And there, I'm sure you would find a video of his uh, speaking with George Martin, who was the Beatles producer. And, um, and they're, they're talking about a tree that, is, that Bernie Krause is recording. I, he doesn't disclose how he is recording it. And I've been wondering about that. But he recorded basically the process of the tree filling its water supply. And, and so it's pretty much inaudible. But then with technology, if you speed up, well, what he did is he sped up the recording or the sound. And then rhythmic content started happening. And so then they made a piece with a percussionist. Um, so yeah, I would love to do, uh, to do music with, with that. I mean, in fact, I mean, I have a lot of sounds that I love using and uh, perhaps for this uh, project would have been an interesting or would be an interesting addition. Thank you. Great, do we have other questions from the audience? Fantastic. Okay. My question is for you. Um, is there a connection between your department and the government, like House and Senate, when they are making decisions regarding environment? Are they going to be shown this kind of uh, documentaries? Uh, well, uh, there's, not direct, uh, there's not a direct connection, um, but I will be going to the National Humanities Alliance, and we will be actually advocating uh, with Congress for support for humanities. And I think that the ways in which these questions of climate change and how they can be recorded in art and in music are the kinds of messages that we want to convey in terms of supporting these points of crossover between science and arts and humanities. Hi, I'm interested in citizen afforestation and reforestation, and traditionally Arbor Day organization has been uh, the option. I'm wondering if, if any of you know of other options. Thank you. Well, I would say please do check out um, our city forest. They are really a fantastic organization working very much on this, but I'll see if either um, Chris Craig, have any thoughts on that? No. <laughs> we are also slowly getting in responses from both Amanda and Robin, who are on the live stream with me, but it takes a little bit for them to type into the tiny chat box. So talk amongst yourselves while, while we're waiting. Well, I had a question um, for Craig, actually. So one of the things that Robin's work is looking at is this particular managed burn. But one of the things that Chris is monitoring in, in terms of the producing of the music is this uh, reforestation and afforestation. And I'm kind of curious how those go together, right? I'm sure that has to do with the local setting in which we operate. We're not experiencing massive loss of forest from like the Amazon. Um, and in many ways, the CZU fire was able to attack a really, really rich, vibrant area filled with trees. So I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about you know, what that means in terms of the goals of reforestation, but the challenges of managed burns. Yeah, thank you. So I'm not a fire ecologist. We have a fire ecologist in our center, Kate Wilkin. But basically, uh, prescribed fire helps reduce the fuel loads. And so that actually helps the forest health. And because there's too many trees, they're uh, taking up too much uh, resources, such as water, and uh, sh too much shade for the surface. And so more trees can grow. So that's one reason why we 
want to have more fire in ecosystems. And a good example of this is the southeast U.S., which has a very robust and very mature prescribed fire system uh, or programs because, especially in Georgia and Florida, you don't think that Georgia and Florida are really lots of fire, but they have more prescribed fire than any other state in the U.S., and that's because of their paper uh, industry. And so they constantly burn, and it's like every year. And so they've managed really clean forests, and uh, they're very healthy. If you drive up, and I, I take these pictures from my class because we teach, we have a new minor degree in wildfire science at San Jose State, and we teach a, a Area R in wildfire science, and it's, so it's an upper division GE. And I show a picture of one side of Highway 88 if you're driving up to South Lake, where it, you can't even see through the forest. And the other side has actually been um, cleared through mechanical thinning. And so they're completely different. They look completely different. You don't think you're in the same spot. And that's actually how the, how the forest should look in the Sierra. We should have very wide open uh, ponderosa pine. And right now, when we drive through the Sierra, and this could be Highway 50, Highway 80, through Auburn, and up through like Colfax, you can't see through the forest. It's just super dense. And a new report just came out that the forests, there's so many millions of trees are dying because of drought and stress and bark beetle impacts that this is a, just a huge problem, not only for our state, but also for the Western US. So that's kind of my perspective. So yes, prescribed fire and um, you know, reforestation, that's, they go hand in hand. And you need to have fire on the landscape to have healthy forests and ecosystems. And, and not just forests, but also grasslands and uh, shrublands. Thank you very much. Kathy, do you have any responses uh, on the chat? Well, uh, Amanda says, I wish I could just call in and respond, but she appreciates what Craig has said and, and says he did a great job with it. <laughs> Are there any other questions from the audience? Yes. I had a question for Chris, um, and I wondered um, for your uh, for one of your videos or recordings, did you actually use animal sounds? For one of you, you did. Thanks for your question. Yes, I, I did use animal sounds in the in 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 both of the pieces. Um, mainly when the forest cover is at the at the highest levels in the data, uh, there are sounds of frogs. There are sounds of uh, woodpeckers. Uh, sound beautiful in the forest because the, the resonating aspect of the forest. Um, let me think what else. Hmm? Oh, yes, geese as well. Thank you, thank you. You know my music better than I do. Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, birds a little bit. Um, and uh, yeah, spring peepers for sure, which are a kind of frog. Mm -hmm. Since we've gone a little past six, I'm going to go ahead and, and wrap this up. Um, I want to thank everybody for coming. I want to thank our presenters. Um, there'll be time for people to mill about. We're going to run a raffle. You'll have an opportunity to talk with those of our organizations that are tabling here and have some opportunity to ask some questions that maybe you didn't get to. Um, I uh, do want to encourage everyone to answer our QR code um, about your experience with this. We had a lot of information for you on your seats about upcoming events at um, in the College of Humanities and Arts at the Hammer. Um, there's a, uh, a cer certificate for discounts at, <laughs> uh, at one of our sponsors. And um, what we're going to close with right now is a 52-second preview of the tr trilogy event on Sunday. So I hope that you can um, happily stick around for that. I think it's a beautiful event. And I can let you know that there definitely are seats available on Sunday night. At di and discounts. <laughs> <laughs>
So do consider joining us on Sunday night for a musical tribute to California's redwoods, sequoias, and Joshua trees. And all of you will be receiving a um, notification of a discount code uh, for registering for this event. So with that, thank you very much. And please help yourself to some food. Thank you.